Hello and welcome, PML fans. I am your introduction, Joe Zamora here, head admin of PML, and we are so proud to announce that we are now on the draftleague.nl website. So if anyone ever wants to join PML Draft, y'all can join when we have signups on the website for draft-league.nl. And with me, I have our host of the video, Stuart Mills. Hello, how are we going? All right, Stuart. Thanks for I having guess... me, Joe. Oh, yeah, no problem. I love that you're here. I love we have a great analysis here to <laughs> break down some of these games. And... Um... Let's go ahead and get on to what happened during week one. And uh, I guess you decide which game we start with. I guess we start with yours, Joe. Well, why not? Start at the very beginning. All right. Commissioner game first. Let's see how this goes down. All right. So the first game we're going to cover today is the uh, New England Chartreuse, coached by Joe versus the, uh, the Tempest. And uh, Team Tempest, so how do you feel going into this match, Joe, just while you're here? Honestly, I felt very confident going into this battle. I knew um, I did prep pretty bulky. So I thought my, my, my walls would break his walls before, um, before uh, our, our, physical, our attackers would actually go at it against each other. And sadly, I I did uh, initiate one of my attackers before it was ready to go. But um, we'll see what you think about the battle in that aspect. Right, well, you know, to be honest, I wasn't feeling too positive for you when I noticed you'd spelt your own team name wrong on your layout. So I was like, oh no, Joe, you're in, in for a bad time. I, I put my name wrong? <laughs> yeah, you spelt your name wrong. The Chartiers. Um, oh, man. You know, to be honest, I think you probably would have won if there was no timer pressure. Um, as we see from our uh, clip, of the, clip of the match, the uh, moment, the turning point, as we're going to call it, the uh, Lycan Rock switching in on the Rotom, taking a hit, and then basically being walled by the Tan Growth and being put to sleep was essentially game over for you as far as winning the game whether or not you could have stretched at the time it was another another call um like to get a timer win but uh yeah i feel like you were on top for most of the game you know you pushed it along you set the pace uh how do you feel about that yeah i mean i did feel i i made the great reads in that battle uh team tippis in his video he really hated <laughs> me for the reads i was making he clicked toxic like three times on skarmory yeah but um i didn't want to win by timer so i i kind of forced lycanroc who is my who was my designated uh maxer in that battle to try to break his team so i can bring dragapult in later and i just when i once i fell asleep i couldn't do it <laughs> i mean that 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 is what ended my my streak, and then I had to start sacking mons that didn't need to be sacked, and I felt stupid when I had Skarmory because uh, Kiwi pointed this out, and I had Skarmory in front of Cinderace at full health, and I swapped out to sack Venusaur when I have Sturdy on Skarmory. I could have lived yeah. the power the pyro ball and revenge killed it. And I, it, it just was not a good week one for me. Yeah, so I totally agree with that assessment. Um, yeah, the early game switches around Kiwi's wrote on by you were great. You eventually got the South Rock up, which is what your original plan was. You know, you led Skarmory. No, uh, Venusaur was, was obviously very. Words. Yeah, it really did. So it was important you got it up. It definitely wasn't worth sacking Skyrim, so switching out turn one was the, definitely the right move. Um, your Venus was very strong in the early game. I think when it got its black sludge knocked off by Tangrowth, it definitely spoiled the longevity because 
obviously sand and synthesis don't go very well together and you didn't really get a chance to synthesis any other time so um Venusaur was definitely put in the work but it was limited in what it could do once it was knocked off i did note um, that i had plenty of chances to synthesis but i preferred to go on the offensive and the one time yeah, i just um, didn't go on the offensive it cost me yeah so yeah the timer was definitely um in your mind from the start i feel which was I think it was evident in the mid game there was lots of switching and there was pivoting mm -hmm. there wasn't really much being achieved by either player and um, obviously someone was trying to find the the high ground but um if anything i think that made you impatient just from <laughs> you know i know how you play and you know that sort of thing so i felt it made you impatient and that was your early dynamax which was unnecessary so yeah. you switched and you switched in your light and rock onto the roton it was an easy boss switch for him Tangrowth um, then came switching in easily and it pretty much walled like a from what I could see. I don't know how much Max Mindstorm did, did to a Tangrowth. Honestly, I kind of underestimated Kiwi in the fact that I thought he would uh, Hydro Pump because I really yeah. wanted to get uh, my weakness policy off, but then he Bolt switched, which I wasn't mad about because I thought, uh, well, I knew Tangrowth would come in. But I thought yeah. Tangrowth would grass move. I did not expect Sweet Powder because I thought it was AV. So yeah, I, he did. He did definitely play it like it was AV. So I thought it was AV as well. Because you know the way the knockoffs and stuff happened. But um, Sweet Powder, when it happened, I was like, oh wow, what a play! Oh, I made that the play of the game because of the fact that you wasted your Dynamax pretty much, and he went into basically an unlosable position. I felt because oh, yeah. it he could max whatever he wanted um once, once yeah it was people just people, yeah i mean i don't know if what max mindstorm and then a second one with the psychic terrain boost i don't know if that did more damage than the two rock moves but being put to sleep was criminally unfortunate like um i think it was a play of the game and um, when me and Chow came in, punched some holes, I think you were completely off your game at this point, and the switch in the Grim ultimately cost you the game. I mean, I still think the HP calculation must have been pretty close, but to lose 4-4 is rough. Honestly, at that point, I thought I, think... I had the game one no matter what I did, and I forgot about Regenerator, and that's what cost me. That. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I Regenerator think... and Skarmory's Sky, Sky, Sky sturdy, I think. Um, you know, you would have survived the hit and probably yeah, killed Cinderace, but... I could have killed Cinderace, and I totally yeah. forgot about the uh, the Regenerator. That, that, that definitely but that's one of those what -ifs. You can't... You know, a lot of people would forget about Sturdy in that situation. You know, you know that the, time, the time's counting down on the screen. That's how close it was to the end. I understand making that play, so... Yeah, it was um, an unfortunate loss, but a loss nonetheless for you. So that was GG for the Team Tempest mm -hmm. in week one. And then that brings us to the next battle versus the Chonks. The Chicago Chonks versus the Crystal Crobats who dropped after week one. Yes, yeah, so uh, as we well know, it's Danny Mack of the Chicago Chonks, got a new team name for this season. Probably one of the top seeds of the league. Oh. Yeah, he was given a very high ranking in the, in the draft ranking. So for me, the play of the game was definitely um, Max Kangaskhan doing Kangaskhan things. You know, Kangaskhan is underappreciated uh, without its mega, but as a normal type, it has lots of fun tricks. And as we found out this week, which protects Kangaskhan is a thing. And it was a great bring. So, the first thing that I'm maxing it, I don't remember if it was a planned max. I think it was just a, I'm going to max because the game's almost over. And um, it came off for It really did. King is kind of put in the work. He got a lot of kills. So, basically, I think Danny was robbed of a big 4 I win here because of the timer. But, you know, that's going to happen with the time of the way it is. We're going to mention it a lot. Mm -hmm. in this video but you know he did pretty much he did pretty much everything right the whole match um 
like I said, the Wish Protect Cam was a great bring and ensured he wasn't going to lose the match. Maybe it was too stally for the short time, if any, could I criticise anything, but it seems strange to say that he dominated, but for every Wish, every Protect, that's one turn not doing damage, which mm -hmm. I feel you need to be doing almost every second turn if you can. But I mean, you've got here to keep him healthy, so Wish Protect is the way to go. That's nitpicking, to be honest. Um, it was a great bring. Yeah, you needed a couple more turns to win, which shows just how frustrating the timer can be. And starting week three, the timer may not be as big of an issue as it will be the first two weeks. Just a little foreshadowing. Bring in the land. Nice. So, um, as for the Crobats, like you mentioned, they actually dropped out of the league, which was a shame, but I don't really have much to say about that. Um, <laughs> I feel like, I feel like, in, the, in this match, Ditto was underutilized, if anything, but ultimately the Crobats had nothing for Kangaskhan, and it's not a surprise that it was MVP of this match. So, yeah, short and sweet for this one because Danny dominated. It's a shame he didn't win, get the full three points because I think he earned it. And the only thing I want to uh, mention is that uh, Danny had the perfect toxicity counter in Marowak Alolan. Because Poison did nothing, Boom Burst did nothing, and it had Lightning Rod ability as a potential thing. Uh, Toxtricity never expected an electric move, but imagine if it just did nothing. <laughs> it yeah, would have been crazy. So you nothing. Know, Walled. Perfect counter. That, that's what you call but a yeah, hard sorry, wall like, Pokemon. Hard wall. So yeah, like I said, short and sweet for this one because. Uh, GG Danny. For sure. Alright, for the next game, we got the Wiki Waki Wishy Washies. <laughs> Mouthful of a name. Versus <laughs> the Crushing Silvali. Yeah, I actually really enjoyed watching this match. Um, I felt like it could have gone either way and watched. Definitely at Team Preview. Um, for me, the turning point was unfortunately turn one. Uh, Rillaboom got absolutely smacked, got absolutely blown back, and just absolutely ruined any utility it had during the match. So, for me, that was the turning point, which was turn one, I do believe. And the fact that the match ultimately went to timer is a credit to um, the Wishy Washy's play, to Lily's play, because, yeah. I think it could have easily fallen apart after that start. A big one, in my opinion, is Kingdra didn't have a water type move in the rain. To abuse. Yes. That's. that's yes. Um, I also put that the, um, the regenerator core was too strong. Um, letting Rillaboom take so much damage was unfortunate early on. And there were too many mons running rain dance. I mean, I can understand on Lipard, which is, you know, actually a good tech because it's got Prankster, mm -hmm. but I feel like if, if she had Whirlpool on Politoed, it would have been great for this match. It would have trapped Mons, um, especially Slow King after it was tricked the specs because it, couldn't, it wouldn't be able to click Teleport. And yes, it would be a slow, painful death for Slow King, but it would still be a death. Um, yeah. Failing that, you could argue that Ice Beam, Ice Beam would have put in work as well on Politoed. She specified that, yeah, probably Rain Dance wasn't necessary on Polytoad, which, uh, of course, it wasn't only yeah. after after the fact that you watched the battle. But, um, you know, you, at that point in prep, you never know uh, when you will need that extra setup of Rain. So, yeah, I agree you bring it if you weren't running Damp Rock, but I feel like if you're running Damp Rock against a team with no weather, mm -hmm. you can pretty much. Which, um, guarantee you're going to have the rain, so you don't need to run rain dance unless you think you're staying in against the mon for longer than eight turns. Which I guess if you're Paris trapping, you know you can switch it in, switch it out, switch it in, switch it out. But um, this, this is what we learned in week one. This is week one, getting people getting to know the toolkit of their teams. And there's definitely no, there's no, it's not a bad. It wasn't a bad tech. I just think it was an unnecessary tech, and it didn't cost it didn't cost them the match. But, you know, it's a lesson to learn for week two. Yeah. Um, 
you know, other than that, I can't really fault the plays made by either team. Regenerator cores are strong in 60 minute time of matches, but in general, in uh, 20 minute time of matches, they're going to be very hard to break down. There's going to be a lot of matches going to timer with those teams. Um, Mika definitely deserved the win though, the Silvales, but Lily shouldn't be discouraged. You know, you, once you get used to the team, it's going to pull some wins through. Um, you know, Kingdra's going to get lots of kills in the rain, just bring Hydro Pump or Scald even, or um, Liquidation Dragon Dance, something. You know, there's plenty of options out there. And yeah, I say roll on week two. I've got full confidence in the wish watch series to come through. I look forward to seeing them because, um, like I said, there are a lot of, a lot of timer wins and losses, but a lot of them don't actually tell the full story of the match, which yeah. is, um, you know, it's, it's a, you know, if only the Pokemon company could listen to these, these sort of videos from everyone. I mean, even Joey Tokyo and put out the whole bring back the timer thing last year because, you know, we're desperate. We're desperate for a timer. Gen yeah, 9 we... needs the 60 minute timer, oh, or at least was... a timer we can choose the time. And we just wanted a timer back, and Pokemon did not listen to us whatsoever. Maybe if Janitsi and Masuda moving on, things might change, but once again, I wouldn't count on it. I they obviously love their VGC, it's the main focus of the game, so 20 minute times for VGC are standard. So, Which honestly, it's sad because it took so long for doubles to be a thing. And all I'm not gonna say Gen 1ers. Just per se, but all all of us all of us Pokemon players who love singles, we really need that timer because there's some people. Hmm. I'm not saying necessarily play stall, but there's some people who yeah. like to run both your teams, and those teams take those teams take time to set up, and those those teams exactly. need that time. <laughs> I mean, even I'm pretty sure. Uh, um, Wolf Click and Aaron Zane and all of them were on board with the main VGC players. So, I mean, they played a lot of singles recently, but they, they understand the 60 minute timer even in non doubles matches. I mean, even a 40 minute anyway, timer. Anyway, we're with Yeah, well, yeah, I was going to say, like, even if you can make it 20, 40, 60 minutes, choose. And you could run a, if you want to run a short league, go for it, make it 40 minutes if you don't want people to stall for an hour. That's understandable, but. There's got to be a happy middle ground somewhere. Somewhere. <laughs> somewhere. Yeah. It, anyway, we're going off track here. That's all I had to say about that match. I don't know if you had any further points to add on, but um, yeah, like I said, I'm looking forward to week two for both these things. No, the, everything you hit on point. So the next matter we have to talk about is the Arizona Chardinals, which... I fucking love that name. Versus the Rebellion, who have Future as their mascot. With a bunch of tattoos, I guess. Arizona Chardinals, yes. Wow. Um, the turning point for me in this match was um, when Stami came in. There was the Thunderbolt prediction by Nido King, followed by the Maxing by Stami. That whole period of the game was. You know, I'm not going to say it's a t necessarily the biggest turning point of the whole match, but for me, it was like the great predictions, the great play from both sides. It summed up the whole game, really. It summed up the whole game. Yeah, and the fact that Arizona Cardinals were sauce, as they would say, uh, pretty drunk. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> they made some great plays in that game. Yeah, I think... Um, I was a little bit worried after the false start when uh, the Cardinals only selected three Pokemon. Luckily, you know, when it's on video, it's almost like, you know, there's no way you're cheating because it's on video. So whatever happens is going to be seen by everyone. Mm -hmm. But, um, I mean, they got the time and went in the end, the Cardinals. It wasn't as convincing maybe as it appeared firsthand. Um, the Rebellion didn't bring Volcarona. That was a questionable decision for me. I don't think it would have changed the result necessarily, but um, yeah, it was almost like they lacked, to, they lacked the offensive power to um, get through the Chargers. Yeah, uh, I do see Volcarona being a problem for the Chardinals, especially with Corviknight and Charmy and Rotom. 
so it is surprising. Yeah, so I, yeah, I definitely think like um, yeah, I definitely think even bringing the bulky, the, the bulky one, bulky equivalents, um might have started off slower, but of course, you know, you get that speed boost and away you go. Um, for me, the Lynch Chief protect Celestina was an interesting choice. I wonder if the offensive autonomized version would have put more offensive pressure on mm-hmm. um, instead of relying on life form mill tank. I don't think I've ever seen life form mill tank. You know, <laughs> surprise value of nothing else. And even the Chardinals were completely surprised by that. Um, to me, I was going to bring, if I was going to bring any mon, um, swap any mon out for Volcarona, it would have been Mr. Ryan. It was Blaze's debate from Team Preview. Um, it did nothing. It came in and died. So, um, almost a wasted spot. But once again, trying new things out. I'm sure it had really, uh, you know, it probably had fake out and a lot of things like that. So it could have been useful. I mean, yeah, yeah. No, 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 okay. no tank itself yeah. is just speedy as hell. So to add a life orb to it, it's just ridiculous <laughs> in draft league format. Yeah. I mean, it could have paid <laughs> off. But, but that's what you see in draft. That's what you see in draft league, exactly. Yeah. But um, Nerekin coming in with a snowy thunderbolt. Great prediction, but unfortunately by that stage, I think the match was as good as done. Um, I love me some Paragon 2. It was a great pivot option in this match. It's a pity it wasn't tracing. I mean, a pity it wasn't the net trace, I think, because it could have traced the invitate off flying one. Could have been interesting with Nido King in the back, but in saying that, you know, Emily like, was going to add hard. Especially when Pro 2 forces a lot of switches. Um, then you've got Golurk proving it to be a force to be reckoned with. It's not the first time I've seen Golurk surprise a team with come in and just hit things hard. It's got no guard. Dynamic punch is a strong move. You know, I guess the confusion guaranteed to hit with the uh, no guard. So powerful, powerful hitters. And. Um, you know, Starmie claims some KOs with the Max and P2 throws it out to seal the timer win. It was, I don't think it was a timer win guaranteed from the very start, but mm-hmm. as you got halfway through the match, I think even the channels noted, oh my gosh, we've got two minutes left, like when did that happen? Um, that was, that, that was how they were going to win with two minutes to go. So they closed it out with P2. GG. GG. And that brings us to our next battle, the the Naruhata Hoppers versus the New Orleans Infernix. Oh, this was a entertaining match. Like I said, they're all entertaining this week, man. I mean, this was one of my favorites. If the, if the game of the week wasn't didn't exist. This would be the game of the week for me, I think. Just because it was so entertaining to watch. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, the turning point was when Morpico maxed and Saito just straight up killed it. Um, people underestimate Saito because it's, you know, it's got the same stats as Scizor. Mm-hmm. It's just got a different typing and you can put an Eevee light on it. And so it can be super bulky. It can be super offensive. It can be whatever you want it to be, basically. And it proved it in this match. So, that was for me the turning point. The I felt like the hoppers were chasing their tails for most of the game. Um, unfortunately, there was no commentary on their video because of an uploading error, so it was hard to work out the reasoning for some of their plays. But you know, toxic, toxic sprites from Tactical were handy. Um, Talent Flame got them ahead early. There was I didn't I was confused with the double status moves over Roost because I think that ended up being crucial. Um, but you know, Morpico using Aura Wheel turning into a Dark type, and then. It was never going to be good against the Saito, even at plus one speed. It was just um, yeah, looking to be destroyed. And it was. And I laughed. I actually laughed out loud at that when I saw it on the video because I was like, <laughs> stupid more people. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if it would have survived if it was a, um, if it was a electric type still, but I mean, hey, whatever. If it wasn't dark type, but yeah, oh man, that was rough. I felt, I felt for them because they maxed. I was like, no, they think that my plus one speed is going to be enough. But yeah, without some kind of rock mm-hmm. move or fire move or you know something super effective, it was going to be a problem. But you know, in saying that, um, you know, the opponents played well to bring it back. Scarf yeah. Togekiss was a great break, and um, 
the fact they held Mimikyu back till the end ended up being a sound strategy. Uh, the priority should have been because they would have killed the Hoppers, Scarf Chiefs, and get the full three points, which is what you want. One of the few teams to get the full three points in week one. Oh, yeah. And um, you got to think, I think Bug, Bug Bite does double damage if your opponent has an, uh, uh, a berry as an item. So, I mean, even Max, that thing was killing and even if it doesn't do that per se, I mean, just yeah. the uh, technician boost alone on a 60 base power move, that's like exactly. 100 base power <laughs> coming from a Scyther, especially if he ran yeah. max attack. And he, and he the berry, correct? And ate the berry as well, I think. It, it was like Secret Berry or something, top. I can't remember the berry. It, it was it, it, that, it the Truffle Berry. berry. So that, yeah, so that was, you know, an extra added bonus. Not that the fighting move was the problem, it was the bug move it turned out, but um, yeah, it's always it's a handy move to have technician bug bite. Don't forget I, it. I honestly think the hoppers didn't expect that Scyther would make an appearance as it did, or at least not do as much damage as it did. But it was very interesting that they kept the Morpico in against the Scyther, even Max. Yes, exactly. Yes, so I don't know if they were unprepared for the site though, or if they didn't do any counts on it, or any, if, you know, maybe they didn't think it was even going to come. So I just felt like it was a great bring, and yeah, so I thought killing that more people. Thanks for coming. All right, well, that brings us to our second to last battle. Uh, crams, oh, sorry, not crams, Camarines. The CF Cramorant yep. versus the Day Day Knights. Dusty thing. Dusty Day Day Car. Well, what a game this was. Um, you know, I just, once again, I laughed out loud when I saw that Thwacky just smash through that Swampert. The <laughs> meme is that Swampert's afraid of a blade of brass, you know, so, you know, having a, even a, even a, a not fully evolved mon destroy it with a grassy glide on the terrain it was just beautiful to watch you know just oh, what, a, what, a, what a point that was i always felt sorry for dusty because that swamp was just waiting to be destroyed yeah i'm sure you were glad the team oh, had yeah. charizard yeah. just went down that's right and then and then the swacky camp the centino as well even better. I hate that mod. I don't know why. I don't know why I hate it, but I do. I, think you I guess it's not all King's Rob. Would you rubbish? Hey? <laughs> yeah, exactly what but, you said. Um, I, no, think, no. I think you hate it because it's still linked King's Rob. Yeah, so, um, yeah, for me, the, that Thwacky, of course, MVP of this match, it was absolutely crazy. And it's good to see it put on work. It's good to see those the lowest. Um, come through and you know this league can only max tier three to five so it was nice to see one of those really really low tier mons pull through and do the max job oh, yeah the not fully involved mons are ridiculous but even then i think let's see the uh thwacky was a tier three non fully evolved Pokemon. tier three that makes sense same as reboot probably uh, yeah. I mean, I can't remember a generation where two NFEs have been so good, NFE starters have been so good. Um, I guess, no, you can't even say Brion or um, Dartrix were any good compared to Toracat. But yeah, just so, it was just great to see. And um, I mean, overall the match was all about residual damage. It was the name of the game. The Cramorants wore Dusty down with toxic, uh, toxic spikes, sand, rocky helmet. Um, Twacky came in and activated its grassy seed, raising its defense by one, destroyed the Swampert. It lived the three hit triple axle from Cinchino thanks to the uh, defense raise. And toxic spikes then put in a range of a second grassy glide, claiming another kill. 
I mean, Dusty switched out, so I didn't die, but um, it didn't help when Dusty maxed a poisoned and confused Zerkatry. I mean, ultimately, it was his last throw of the dice, right? He knew he was behind the eight ball. He knew he had to throw something out, and uh, that's what he tried. And Zerkatry did absolutely nothing, thanks to a great prediction by the Cramorants, and it got destroyed by a on. So, definitely not Dusty's finest hour as far as week ones go, but... Hopefully in week two, he can uh, pull something out and show us what he's made of. Mm -hmm. oh, I was just going to say, and then um, the Cremorants sacked Primarina and Chino, and then Thwacky just cleaned up. So, you know, that's a strong 5-0. And, uh, and when all the other matches are so close, I feel like this was the most dominant. All right. Well, that brings us to our last battle of the week because we did have... Um, the Virginia Pressure versus the Memphis Maniacs not be battled out. Memphis Maniacs gained the forfeit win for that battle. So the final battle of this week will be the Virginia Victinis versus the Machesney Park Slowpokes. Yeah, so uh, this was my game of the week. I found it the most entertaining. I watched both sides. Um... For me, the turning point was the Nino Queen Max turns. It was a great bring. It was always going to be a real problem um, for the opposition to deal with. So, yeah, I think that was the highlight for me. Um, you know, I did. You think about the strong runs that the opposition has for Simeon, um, Naganadel, and Nino Queen can pretty much deal with those slurp off Scissor. You know, there's not much that can take Nino Queen down in that lot, uh, especially when maxed. So, I mean, you know, it was a great entertaining match, very close, um, despite all that. What did you, how did you feel when you watched it? So, from my opinion of the battle, um, it was a very back-and-forth game. It was a great game, to be honest. I mean, Nagano Dale coming in with the flamethrower uh, all the way to where the wreck it. The Virginia Bikinis came in with their emotion and just started triple acting stuff. Um, there was just so much offensive power in this game. It was hard to see who was actually going to win it. Mm -hmm. Slurpuff Mac belly drumming and maxing his attack, but not being able to Dynamax was big because he did uh, Dynamax the Simeon early on with no stab move. So it was yeah. just like... Uh, Anything could happen I mean, in this game at this point. Yeah. I mean, Mike was on top for most of the match, this, despite that turn one Thunderwave miss. Mm -hmm. um, Dynamax and Persimian was it was already an interesting play, but it was going to be absolutely punished um, if he got paralyzed. So um, he was very lucky there. It was interesting listening to the Slowpoke side that a Prater predicted to switch to Mandibuzz, but still clicked Max Quake in front of the Duralidon. He's going to switch to Mandibuzz. Still click Max Quake. So, I don't know, it's probably a lesson for, ne for next week. You know, if they've got a flying type, they're probably going to switch it in if they are weak to round on. But, you know, you can't, that's that's a prediction sometimes you have to make. If they'd kept the Duralidon in, it would have been a great start to the match. So, I mean, ultimately, the Persimian Max turns did very little other than to bring Mandibuzz down to about 25-30%. And then... Um, Persimian got okayed by that max that max Neto Queen, which I talked about earlier. It then all, also okayed the signal lift with Max Lightning. Um, he recognised he messed up though because he baits the Max Quake by bringing in the uh, with the bringing in the Colossal, switches the Colossal out to the Air Balloon Air Balloon the Gunnerdale, which was that was probably the play of the match, the single play of the match. But um, you know it was all because of the offensive pressure put on by Neto Queen, which is normally seen as the defensive Neto. Um, but, you know, I've used Nino Queen quite a bit in the past, and you've got to watch out. You know, it's got, still got Sheer Force, it's still got all that, so um, you got to watch out for that. Unfortunately, really, Nagano now didn't have anything decent to hit Nino Queen with, and so had to switch back to Colossal, who, you know, got blown back by an Earth Power. I don't know what I would have done in that position. Maybe Nasty Potter with Nagano now taking the hit because it wouldn't have been super effective because it was the air balloon, and then maybe there was something that could kill the second turn. Um, it's hard to say what the right play was really in that situation. Unfortunately, they 
the Slowpokes never really recovered. They were down 6-3 in the blink of an eye. The fact that they got so close in the end, um, you know, it was they got the margin right down to a 1-0 from that 6-3. It's just absolute credit to the Slowpokes. Um, you know, the belly jump slurp off and the, the sword dance is a, they're a bit scary, you know. The Victorians played around them pretty well, but they still had to take, you know, sack a few mons and um, ultimately Firamosa would have probably come in clutch with, uh, you know, they would have made it a 2-0 win perhaps, but uh, the two hit triple axle and the Helios then took a flamethrower from Nagana down, no problem. Um, maybe I would have gone for the Dark Pulse flinch perhaps to you know, maybe get it closer. Even if Helio was dry skin, but that's another what if situation. You can't predict that mid game, especially when you know you're under pressure from the timer. And yeah, all in all, it was a great entertaining match. And I, you know, I think a well deserved game of the week. Um, I really enjoyed it. I really did. It was quality play from both teams. Like I said, getting down from 6 3 to 1 0 was just absolute class. A lot of players would have just chucked it in and taken the 6-0 or you know they wouldn't have uh, put in the effort after being down so early but uh no it was great it was really good all right pml fans and with those battle recaps out of the way we're going to go ahead and turn our attention to mvp for the week and that of course is going to go to cf cramorantis thwacky coached by cram himself well, he got four kills with thwacky a non-fully evolved Pokemon, though it is tier 3, and it showed off why in the first game of the season. It got that early um, kill on Swampert with that grassy glide. I'm sure Dusty didn't expect that thing to kill for him almost full, but that Swampert went down thanks to that 4 times weakness to grass. And then um, Chinchino came in. Thwacky was able to get a good chunk off with the Grassy Glide as it switches out. Uh, later comes back in while the Chinchino uh, killed Primarina. So Thwacky got its revenge for its teammate there by taking down Chinchino with a Grassy Glide there. Then Chansey came in. Uh, with Thwacky at pretty low health, uh, it was able to use a Drain Punch to get some health back. Some switches happened. Um... Araquanid came in on Thwacky's a hit. And then uh, Thwacky hit it with that max overgrowth. Then it moved into the max airstream to kill the Araquanid. And then Chansey, all alone, had to take a max knuckle from it as it boosted its attack. And it was able to drain punch it after that because Chansey was not able to do enough with Seismic Talk. And now that the MVP honors has been announced, we are going to turn our attention to the rankings for the end of week one. And of course, normally we don't do rankings so early in the season, but I feel, you know, might as well give the people what they want. Right now in the Kanto division, we have Cram sitting at number one, of course, with that 5-0 victory over Dusty. Then second, we have the Chicago Shonks. Uh, coached by it's Danny Mac and he got his 1-0 victory and um, sadly it went to timer he didn't get to get that fourth kill so it could have been a plus four but sadly it's just a plus three but I'm sure he's not mad because a win's a win and then in third place we have the LA I mean uh, da, 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 um, what is it LA. And then in third place, we have the New Orleans Infernapes, coached by Melvin, 1991. And he was able to get a slim 2-0 victory, but, you know, two's better than none. And then that leads us to our fourth place contender in Team Tempest, coached by Kiwi. Uh, he was able to get a timer 4-4 win versus us and giving him that 1-0 victory, but zero deferential. Uh, then fifth place, of course, that is the New England Chartriots. They lose 0-1 to Timer, a very close Timer battle, but lost nonetheless. And then in sixth place, we have the Naruhata Hoppers, 
coached by Misery Gear. Losing in week one, so they end up with the 0-1 with a negative two differential. But they will come back strong, I'm sure, next week. Uh, next up, we have the Aqua Jets, the New York Aqua Jets, now coached by Fraz Tippy. They did not play that week one, uh, but they did take over for the team that lost uh, three by three Pokemon. So their stat right now is 0-1 with a negative three. And then Dusty, of course, in eighth place with that negative five loss. So it's 0-1 with a negative five differential. Now we move over to the Galar side, and we have the Memphis Munchlax in first place, taking that forfeit win and uh, running away with it, getting a plus three differential, sitting at 1-0 in the first spot. Next up, we have the Crushing Silvales, who also got a 1-0. They did play their match, and they were able to clutch a 3-0 victory for the 1-0 win. I mean, plus three differential in that 1-0 win. Plus three differential in that week one win, giving him a record of 1-0. Third place, we have the Arizona Cardinals with a 1-0 with the plus two differential Virginia Victinis with the one oh with the zero differential because um I believe the McChesney Park Slowpokes had a Pokemon that went down on its own or due to own weather we would have to verify that but uh that is a zero differential for the Virginia Victinis fifth place we have the McChesney Park Slowpokes at 0 and 1 and only a negative one uh, sixth place, we have Rebellion, coached by Lucian. Um, Lucian Flash. I'm sorry, uh, Arizona Cardinals, coached by Orizian. Uh, Virginia Victinis, coached by wreck -It Mike. McChesney Park Slowpokes, coached by Apparator54. And then we come back to the Rebellion. They did get the 01 for week one and a negative two differential. In seventh place, we have Wiki Wiki Waki Wishy Washies coached by Lily. And they also have the 01 with a negative three differential. And then the Battlefield Tour catch has been taken over by Shelby. And um, she will be the let's see the name here. Pecatonica Fire Squirrels with the mascot of a Flareon. And um, since they're taking over for a team that forfeited week one, uh, we went ahead and gave her only a negative three because uh, the forfeit winner gets a positive three. So to try to make it a little bit more fair for her. So she has the 0-1 record with a negative three differential. All right, well, that brings us to our conclusion for the week one recap. I hope you guys enjoyed all the clips we have to offer you for each game that has been played. And I hope you all give a great thanks and to Stuart J. Mills for bringing us our week one recap. Oh, it was a pleasure, Joe. Thanks for having me. I, um, you know, I've never done this sort of recap analysis of weeks worth of games before so you know we're learning you, you guys are learning so go easy on me but uh yeah i'm happy to you know talk about things in the comments of the video or if um you know i'm on i'm on discord student 101 I'll, i'm in the server as well if you want to have a chat to me so you know i'm happy to chat pokemon anytime so thank you very much Oh yeah, Stew Dog 101 is ready to talk and chat about anything. And if anyone ever wants to join a PML draft, again, we are on the draftleague.nl website. Always join the PML Discord and we can get you guys in with some of the best draft leaguers of all time. Um, I So we thank you guys for watching. This has been me, Joe Zamora, and Stuart. 
Yo. <laughs> and we are out for week one. We will see you in week two. Thank you guys for watching. Leave a like, subscribe. Bye. We will see you guys next time.